All right, Galatians chapter 2. We're going to start out here. If you can turn in your King James Bible to Galatians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. It says here, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. In other words, there Paul checked with those other believers. He said, okay, what do you think of this? And they kind of weighed it out and things. Paul did not say, I have this, this single revelation from God and I don't care what anybody else says. No, there's a thing there as Christians, we should be willing to talk to other Christians and stuff and weigh things out and whatever, you know. That's again one of the reasons why you should be taught by many witnesses, the Bible talks about there. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, This is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Okay, so Paul had the authority. I mean, he's coming. He has the revelation of the Lord directly given to him. But still he's saying in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's a good precedent to have. If you're hearing something from a man and nobody else ever teaches this stuff, you know, and you're not really seeing it, in the Bible, you need to be careful of that, okay? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says, Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. All right? Now, of course, don't take that to the other extreme of, you know, I'm going to go along with what the majority of people say. That's also a bad idea, okay? The Bible teaches moderation, don't go too far to the left. Don't go too far to the right. Okay, Don't say, I don't want any teachers. Don't say, I'm going to listen to all teachers. Okay, You need to get that thing sorted out. Galatians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says here, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of... Now look at this. This is so important. Because of false brethren, unawares, brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now you need to get a hold of that thing, okay? False brethren unawares brought in. This isn't false brethren that came in to a bunch of newly saved Christians that really didn't know any better. They came in among the apostles, they came in there and, you know, notice it says about 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem where all the apostles were and false brethren had come into that midst there, come into the midst of them. And in fact, we're going to see in a little bit here, they actually were deceiving some of the apostles, Peter, in other words. Hmm. So false brethren can come in and deceive people even strong Bible-believing Christians. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And you say, well, uh, what was this thing about there? They came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What's that all about? Trying to get them back under the law. That's the another gospel there. Trying to get people back under the thing of you have to keep the Ten Commandments to stay saved. That's very dangerous. You say, but why on earth would the Jews want to mess with these early Christian believers, I don't understand that. Why would these, you know, false convert Jews come in and try to mess with those early Christians? Acts chapter 5, you can turn there in your Bible. We're going to read a bunch of verses here. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 is where we're going to start out. It says here, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Uh-oh. So the people see these early Christians and they're going, wow, these people are really great and everything else. They're magnifying them. Verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. 
You know, that would be kind of a popular thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, big time. And what's going on there? The Jews that rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they're watching all this stuff happening. And people are coming up to him and they're saying, did you see what the apostles did? Did you see what Peter, this Peter guy, did, did you see what he did? I had this relative and they were crippled and, and they got healed. Did you see that? Why can't you do that, Rabbi? You can just see these rabbis, you know, these Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and things and they're just, just boiling with rage. Why? The early Christians are more popular. See? The early Christians having the Holy Spirit bring more and more and more people in. False religions can't have that. They don't have the Holy Spirit bringing more people in. They have to go out and make proselytes, see? You know, Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew chapter 23 about you compass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than you, than yourselves, you know? Incredible. And see, these Jews are there and they're watching all this all these people becoming Christians. That's why they're like, okay, let's go infiltrate these groups. Let's get them back under our system. Let's bring them in. Hmm. But let's continue. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. <laughs> How's that for a good one? You know, these guys get put in prison because they're preaching and the Lord comes, busts them out of jail and says, Go back and preach. Wow. You know, how very contrary to the way most modern Christians think of Jesus. Verse 21, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and they called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within." Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. <laughs> you know, and teaching the people. Wow, what a shock. Now look at this. And here's another key to this whole thing. Verse 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. Huh. If you remember from chapter 1 last week, Galatians chapter 1, it talked about being a man pleaser. If I fear man, then I'm not the servant of God. These people feared the people. See? It was about popularity. It was about numbers. First, they're grabbing them and throwing them into prison, and then it's just like, oh, we're just back here. We just want to talk to them. You know, they feared the people. Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Another very important key scripture there. Okay, The fact of the matter is, organized religious cults, cannot grow by God's power. They have to rely on their own resources, on their own techniques. That's why many of the uh, Babel buildings of today, many of them are having to employ worldly tactics and methods, playing Hollywood movies and, and hot rod nights and, and you know picnics, picnics and get-togethers and clothing meets and swaps and things. All this worldly stuff. Why? To bring people into their church building. That's what they have to do. They cannot rely on the Holy Spirit to increase their numbers because they don't have the Holy Spirit. And that's why a lot of times false brethren will creep in unawares to groups of Christians. That's why it's important to meet, you know, with people that you know are saved, you know, and stuff like that, like they would have done in the first century. And even then they still were infiltrated 
But, I mean, you have a, a Babel building someplace where anybody's invited into the thing. You don't know what's going on in there. I mean, I have heard nightmare stories of people that come into the Babel buildings. And, and I mean, they're just government agents and, and Lord knows what else. Jesuits and whatever else. I mean, we're talking bad situation. But these false religious cults will go after true ministries. They will try to infiltrate true ministries. It's right there. Pretty amazing. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 5. Now, what did they do when they found out about these false brethren? It says here, To whom we gave place by subjection? No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Okay? If you are a Bible believer, you need to refuse to compromise with error. If you see somebody that is in serious doctrinal error, okay, preaching another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit, okay, an antichrist spirit, if you see that, you say, no, out, you know, just get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. Well, couldn't we just sit down and talk about, it? no, away, go away from me, okay? Because you see, when you're a Bible believer and people say, let's compromise, Nine times out of ten, that compromise is going to be away from the Bible. Okay? They're going to get you to try and abandon your standards, your Bible-based standards. That's why you cannot compromise. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, avoid them, or mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Okay? Again, you know, I've talked about that a lot in these different studies, but, you know, that verse is so very important. A lot of people don't, you know, understand that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, also some more important scriptures here. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Now, I hit these verses a lot because they are so important. Okay? I mean, I have seen so many ministries on YouTube that they're King James only. We use only the King James Bible. And you think, well, that's good. But then you start watching them and it's like, ooh, boy, that was very heretical what that guy just said. You know? And you see that that's kind of the way the ministry is leaning, you know. It's not just, oh, he made a mistake. No, it's actually a lot of the videos are on that subject. Bad thing. Okay. The only way for the gospel to continue, okay, it says there that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Galatians chapter 2, verse 5. The only way for the gospel to continue in a pure form is to reject error. Okay. Don't let people come in and pervert the gospel of Christ. When they're trying to do that, get away from them. Okay, Galatians chapter 2, verse 6 through 9. We'll read these verses. But of those who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now when you read that, you can see that Paul didn't bow down to the other apostles, but he wanted to be in unity with them. Again, as I said earlier, it wasn't that Paul was saying, you know, hey, I am the holy apostle and I don't care what anybody else says. No, he's going up to him and he's saying, hey, let's discuss this stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's some false brethren. Hey, out. We're not going to give you place by subjection, not even for an hour. Get out. Out. Out you go. You know, but he's saying, you know, I want unity with you guys, but if you're going to try to lord over me, it isn't going to work. All right. Um, the fact of the matter is, every one of us is going to have to give an account of himself to God. 
Every one of us is going to have to stand before the Lord someday and say, how much did we line up with this book? And you aren't going to be able to hide behind a preacher when you get up there at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to be able to say, well, I didn't know. I, I, you, know I, you could have known. Okay? If you are really diligently seeking for truth, the Lord will guide you. The Lord will direct you. And he will show you when a preacher is right and when he'll show you when they're wrong. Okay? And, you know, if you see a preacher that's wrong in a few points and it's not a major, major thing, well, you know, don't just be like, I condemn anybody who's wrong or who's off. Be careful. Have, have a little bit of grace, you know. But, uh, again, the Bible is your standard. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Very similar there to, you know, what Paul wrote in Galatians 2, verse 6, God accepteth no man's person. God doesn't respect the fact, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're uh, of, you know, you're a denlinger, you know, wow, you know. God doesn't care, you know. He's not a respecter of men's persons. He only cares about what you're doing, okay. What are you doing for the Lord, all right? Important to remember that. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. You can go there if you want to. Going to see a couple more verses here about this thing of, of uh, you know, the praise of men, the respect of men, having this high position. You saw last week's study. You'll see that God doesn't often choose those that are mighty, those that are noble, you know, those that are considered wise. You know, God chooses the foolish to confound the wise. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you, observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Hmm. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Watch out for armchair preachers, okay? Watch out for men that don't know how to work, you know, do manual physical labor. All right. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi, rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Watch out for the thing of religious titles too, by the way. That's kind of dangerous. Verse 9, Matthew 23, verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. When you get into ministry, learn to be humble. All right? If God does something great through you or for you or with you or whatever, Humble yourself. Give God the glory. You know, uh, my wife is very, very good at that. You know, I'll be, we'll be doing things or whatever, go to the store and somebody will say something nice and she'll say, well, praise the Lord. You know, they'll say something nice about her. Well, praise the Lord. You know, she's always giving God the glory. And I've, I've learned to respect that and I'm trying to, you know, imitate that. You know, I'm trying to do that with my own life. Give God the, the, the glory in all things. That's what we should do. And, you know, we should not have celebrity Christians either. That's another thing. You know, that's also very important. But go back to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. Okay, it says here, Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Well, what should we remember the poor for? You know, well... You see, we should remember the poor in the sense of we should have welfare and we should, you know, really, I mean, we should have all the same wages and, and all live in compact cities and things like that. I mean, communism is a wonderful system. You know, is that is that what's going on here? No, that's not what's going on. Communism is not a, a system for Bible-believing Christians. What's going on here is the fact that poor people oftentimes are going to be better off with their faith. 
God's no respecter of persons, you know. God doesn't care if you're a millionaire or if you make $5,000 a year or less. If you make no money a year, if you're saved, you know, and doing the work of the Lord, that's what he cares about. You know, and I understand there's a thing there providing for your own. I understand that. But the fact is, God's not impressed with money down here on this earth. But it's interesting because if you really study the thing out, the people who have the strongest relationship with the Lord are almost always those who have the least amount of money. Hmm. I had a guy tell me the one time, a friend of mine, he said to me, it seems almost like the devil works from the top of society down to the bottom. You know, the celebrities down. The Lord works from the bottom up. You have more people being used of the Lord down here in the bottom strata of society. You know, the people that live in the inner cities, the people that live in the trailer parks, the people that are, you know, whatever. I mean, I another story, I I don't know if I've ever told this before, but the same guy that, that was saying that, we were out uh, going door to door the one time and we went into this trailer park and there was a trailer and this woman was totally blind. And she was saved. We, we, we witnessed to her and everything. She was definitely a saved woman. And some of her neighbors had nicer vehicles. They had nicer trailers. They could see. They weren't blind. And they were proud and arrogant and on their way to hell. And I thought, isn't that something? Here you have this woman who's despised by the world. You know, I mean, they didn't hate her or her neighbors, I'm sure. But they're just like this blind woman over there. And she's got this religious, weird religious beliefs and stuff like that. She's going to be a saint ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ in heaven. And these other people, unless they repent, they're going to go to hell. Isn't that something? A poor, blind, single woman on her way to heaven. Married. You know, people that have more money than her. And they're going to go to hell. And we've gone to, you know, we went to exclusive developments too, where it wasn't trailer parks. It was huge, big houses, you know, probably... Three hundred thousand dollars and up for these houses, and and I mean we didn't. I think the one we went to, we didn't want meet one single saved person in the whole place. <laughs> I mean it was quite wicked. So you know the the commission there that these guys are given, you know, go to the poor. It's because they're the ones that are going to want to hear the gospel much sooner than those that are rich. Look at uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 35 through 37. There's an interesting thing here. It says here, And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that uh, Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord, and whence is he then his son? Now look at this. And the common people heard him Gladly. Huh. So you got all this, these upper class guys, these Pharisees, doctors of the law, rabbis, you know, all these great educated scholars, and they all hate Jesus, but the common people are hearing him gladly. Hmm. Very interesting. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 through 19 says, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Hmm. There was actually a prophecy given in the Old Testament that Jesus, when he would come, would preach to the poor. And think of what Jesus Christ was. You talk about lowly. He's a homeless Jew that works as a carpenter. You say, uh... You know, people say, where were you born? You Were you born in a barn? Uh, Jesus was. Hmm. Very interesting. But let's get uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 19 through 23. 
says here, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto them, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You know, it's a whole lot easier to not be offended by Jesus Christ when you don't have much money. You know, it's really appealing to think, someday I'm going to leave this old house behind or this old pickup truck or whatever else you have. I'm going to leave this behind and get a mansion of gold. You know, I'm going to go to be with Jesus Christ, walk streets of gold, and I'm going to get a crown of glory and everything else. That's a whole lot easier to think about and a whole lot more attractive when you don't have much money here on the earth than if you are very, very wealthy. You know, because then you're thinking, well, I work so hard for all this stuff, and I have to leave it behind? Oh, boy, well, you know, what's going to happen to my yacht and my, and my you know, 5,000 square foot house and, and my Mercedes? Who's going to get my Mercedes? You know? <laughs> See? Okay, rich people are going to have a harder time getting saved. Why? Because they're holding on to the world much tighter. Poor people, it's just like somebody says, uh, you know, you're going to die someday. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to leave all this stuff behind. It'll be like, all what stuff? <laughs> that old truck, that old house, these old clothes, you know, mm -hmm. no big deal. See, that's why the Lord was called to preach to the poor. And that's why as we, as, as, as Christians, I'm not saying don't witness to rich people, but I'm saying you're going to find that that's really where you have a hard time. And your best bet is to get around the sinners, get around those people, all of sin, I realize that, but I'm saying get around those people that know that they're sinners, get around those people that don't have much of an income. James chapter 2, verse 1, is going to be especially important in the time of Jacob's trouble. Which I believe is what this book is written for. But let's start here in James chapter 2, verse 1. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect of him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved, beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? Yeah, they do. You know, I'll never forget, I was in uh, Honduras a number of years ago. We stayed in this little village out in the middle of, you know, the banana fields, basically. And these people, I never saw such poverty. It was amazing. And uh, I remember there was this guy there, and he always had the same clothes on, you know, and, and probably that was all he had. And he had these, you know, rubber boots and, and old dirty jeans and an old T-shirt and... Uh, and he didn't smell all that good. But I'll tell you what, that guy loved the Lord. And while most men avoided, you know, going to the little church service there in that in that town, the church, you know, their church was an old building, didn't have any windows in it, just totally open, dirt floor, wooden benches, you know, that was their church. And uh, this guy, he was there all the time. You know, and they'd be singing hymns and stuff, and he'd be there singing, you know, at the top of his lungs. All the other men in the village, you know, they'd avoid the place. They didn't want anything to do with the Lord. And I'd see people laughing at him and things, you know. And, he, you know, he was kind of, I don't think he was all, you know, all there up here. But uh, the fact is, he knew enough to know the Bible. He knew enough to love the Lord. And it's funny because, and that guy was about as poor as you can get, by the way. I mean, we're talking... 
I've never met anybody in America that's that poor. I mean, this this guy, it was bad. But you know what? That guy's going to rule and reign someday with Jesus Christ. He's going to be walking the streets of gold in heaven. How amazing. And that guy, you give a guy like that a Bible, he would cherish it. You know, you go to some of these poor countries and you say, you know, would you like a Bible? Really? I can have a Bible? All to myself? You know? Yeah. You go here to America, you say, hey, would you like a Bible? People go, get that thing away from me. I don't want that. Or if, or if they take it, they're like, mm, whatever, you know, and they throw it in the corner or throw it someplace or whatever else. That's why the Lord calls Christians to preach to the poor. We have something to offer them. Very interesting. But continuing here, Galatians chapter 2. Go back to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Okay? It says here, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Okay? And, you know, I, I have to disagree with Paul here, because after all, Peter was the first pope, according to Roman Catholicism, so Paul really had no right to rebuke the pope. <laughs> of course, I'm being sarcastic here. You know, God's not a respecter of persons, and Paul, you know, he wrote about there in, in the first chapter of Galatians, if you saw last week's study, Paul was like, you know, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no, accepteth no man's person, you know. He wasn't going to submit to anybody. Paul's authority was the book. And Peter was not living according to the book. He was starting to do some things that were fleshly and carnal. And Paul went up to him and rebuked him in the face. You know, I've had to rebuke some brethren uh, that I love very dearly in the Lord. And I've had to rebuke them. Because why? They get away from the book. They get they do start doing things that are wrong and, and saying things that are wrong. You know, I say, hey. You can't be doing that, you know? And I don't need to, like, permanently cut off certain ministries and stuff like that. No, I just, I give my rebuke and I back off. They heard what they needed to hear and I back off. So, but let's continue. Galatians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. It says here, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. In other words, Jews there. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Very interesting there. Because it's kind of like a lot of the Baptists do today with uh, their church buildings. They'll do this thing with uh, proper attire. I heard a guy preaching one time, uh, uh, Cliff Burwell, his name was, he was an evangelist. And, you know, saved man, loved the Lord. I, I don't believe he's lost. But he said the one time about how that he's seen church people out in, in the world out, outside of the you know church building. And he says they're dressed like a bunch of heathen. And I thought, well, you know, okay, I'd like to know how you define that. I mean, you know, I certainly if a woman's dressed immodestly, that's wrong. But, you know, I think a lot of these guys, I, I mean, I knew, I've known a Baptist that say if you wear jeans, it's a sin. You know, I mean, jeans? blue jeans, you know, how's that a sin? You know, I mean, I've, I've known these guys there, they'll be out working, you know, sawing up wood and stuff like that with dress pants on and nice shoes. Why? See? And what happens is you get some poor man in vile raiment that comes into one of these Baptist church buildings and he comes in there and he's not dressed all that nice. He's got jeans on and a, and a shirt like this kind of, you know, and he comes in there, and it's like you see these brethren that are with the black suit and the white shirt and the black tie, and they look and they're like, oh boy, you know. And you kind of snob them. You say, well, brother, I don't know if that, it goes on. You don't want to, you want to know why I know it goes on? Because I used to do it. When I was a real staunch, independent, fundamental Baptist, I would do that. I'd see these people that come in that aren't dressed all that nice, I'd snob them. I just had this attitude like, why would you come to church without a the proper attire on? That's wrong. Shouldn't be doing that. Definitely should not be doing that. 
Very similar to what was going on there back in the book of Galatians. But uh, verse 14, Galatians 2 verse 14. It says here, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Okay? Let me ask you a question, though. What is the truth of the gospel? It says there, according to the truth of the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I uh, really hate to tell you this, but the fact is you are a sinner until the time you die and go to be with the Lord. All right? And you're supposed to fight sin. You're supposed to have a life of sanctification. You are supposed to clean up your flesh after you get, you know, clean up your life, I should say, after you get saved. That's all there. But don't let that sanctification make you forget the fact that you're still a sinner and make you forget the fact of who you were when you first got saved or better yet before you got saved don't get so high and mighty and thinking so greatly of yourself that you start to get a chip on your shoulder towards people that don't have your standards all right see where people are at in their in their faith you might get somebody that's a brand new convert and they're still doing some really worldly fleshly things have some grace have some mercy all right? Don't get into this thing if you get around a bunch of Christians and you see somebody in vile raiment and you go over and you hang out with all the guys in suits and ties. Or if you're a woman, you go and you hang out with all the women that are dressed nice, you know, and everything. All right? You need to be very conscious of the fact that there are still people out there that are struggling with sins. All right? And by the way, in the, in the context of this thing, you know, these Gentiles weren't even sinning. All right? It's not that they were doing wrong and they, you know, pulled back from them. They're just, you know, here you have these Jews and they're they're buddy buddy with the Gentiles and all of a sudden a bunch of Jews come in, you know, and they're like, you know, oh, look, you know, why are you living like these Gentiles and these other Jews are like, "Oh, yeah, we don't want to be like a Gentile." And they they pull away from them and the Gentiles are going, "Wait a second here. I thought we were brothers and sisters in Christ. What's going on here?" See, we don't see that distinction as much today, but it was definitely there in the first century. Very interesting. But uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 says here, We who are Jews by nature's, nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. All right. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. We'll read about this thing, you know, the sinners of the Gentiles. It says, then Paul, stood up, or, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown, unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Okay? Now, what's going on there is this thing of we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. The Jews were the ones that had all this truth and everything. They had the Old Testament that they understood who God was and what God's plans were and that Jesus died for them, the Jewish people, but then also that since they rejected as a nation, now the gospel goes to the Gentiles as well. And so Paul's out there and he's talking to these Gentiles. These people here, uh, the Athenians basically, are pagans. Okay, They have this altar to the unknown God. They spend their time in nothing else but to hear or tell some new thing, kind of like most people today. But you know, he comes to them and he's saying, I'm declaring this. You people are too superstitious. You're just a bunch of, of lost heathen, lost pagans. But I'm here to declare the God that I know about. Okay? He was a Jew by nature. He wasn't a sinner of the Gentiles. Okay, you see that thing there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Okay? And I praise God for that. I am glad that 
You know, in a, I mean, it would have been nice for the Jews to accept Jesus as their Messiah back there in the first century, nationally accept him. But I'm kind of glad that they didn't, because if they had accepted him, things might have turned out very differently. Okay. So I praise the Lord for salvation. But go back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. We'll read down through verse 18. It says here, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Okay? So what Paul's saying is, we are Jews, yeah. The Old Testament was committed to us, that's true. And we have a special place, but we can't take this special, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This special thing, this blessing, this uh, heritage, okay? We can't take that and begin to elevate that thing and start to go back to the Old Testament because we have to remember that stuff is done away with. Let me show you here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8 through 14 says here, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. What is this time of reformation? It goes on to say it, verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So what's going on there is Jesus Christ did not come to overthrow the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. Why? That blood of bulls and goats and all those things, the sheep and things that they were sacrificing, those things could not take away sin. And all those rules and all the, Le the Levitical laws and everything else that was back there in the Old Testament those things were done away when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And what's happening is the Jews are going, yeah, but that's what, that's what makes us distinct from all the other people. You know, we have those distinctions. We have this godly heritage. And so they felt superior to these Gentiles. I mean, you get some pagan that's up there on a hill worshiping an altar to the unknown God, and all of a sudden he gets saved, and now he's on equal footing with this Jew that has this godly heritage going back for thousands of years? Yeah. And these guys were having a hard time with it, some of these people. That's why they were trying to draw them back under the law. They'd say, oh, you're a Gentile Christian. Oh, that's wonderful. Let me explain to you the Old Testament. And the Gentile Christian's going, well, yeah, I don't know anything at all about the Old Testament. And they say, oh, that's good. By the way, you should start dressing this way, and you should stop eating this, and you should start doing this, and you should start... They're trying to pull them back in all those things there that we just read about there. You know, you know, it stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances. See? They're trying to draw them back into that thing. That's what the whole book of Galatians is about. That's why this modern day Hebrew roots movement is so wicked. Why? It's the same thing. They're trying to you get all these people. Most of the time, they're not even Jews. They're not even descendants of Jews. But you get all these people, and they're trying to draw people back and trying to get them to live after the manner of the Jews. We're not supposed to do that anymore. Okay? Watch out for that Hebrew root stuff. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. It says here, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? So, you see this thing there again of, you know, 
you are now, you know, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You have died to that law. That law is no longer there that you have to keep that thing to stay saved. That's not what's going on there. Okay, now you are supposed to stay away from sin. And I read about that in the last you know, chapter there, Galatians chapter 1, the last study that we did. But I want to just hit a couple of these same verses again. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, so you see that thing there. All right, the law is not something that you have to keep to stay saved. All right. But then you say, well, then I can just do whatever I want. No, you can't do that either, okay? You are supposed to be dead to sin. The old man is buried there when you get saved, all right? Galatians chapter 2, verse 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain, okay? If righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And the number one thing that you will run into when you are out witnessing to people, the number one group that you will run into is people that struggle with self-righteousness. Guaranteed going to happen. You know, and they think that they're getting into heaven by their good, own good works. You know, and I remember this one time I was at this gas station and this guy saw the back of my truck and I have my witnessing bumper stickers on there. And and uh, this this guy you know, started talking to me and things, and, and then he went in to pay for his gas or whatever, and, and uh, his son started talking to me, and, and uh, just rough old country boy, you know, and, and he was like, you know, yeah, you know, sorry about my old man, you know, kind of kind of talking to you, and I was like, oh, it's all right, I don't mind that, you know, I, I talk about the Lord, I'm not, I'm not afraid of talking about the Lord or having people ask me questions, no big, no big deal, and I, and he was like, uh, well, he said, you know, to me, I just, I think you do your best, you know. I think that you can get into heaven, just do your best. You know, I try to do my best. And I said, uh, so you just, you're going to get in by being a good person? And he said, yeah, I think so. And I said, uh, well, then who did Jesus die for? New thought entered into the brain there, you know. He didn't answer it. He said, well, you know, well, you know, we all have our own opinions and blah, blah, blah. Went off another direction. Hey, that's a good question. If you can be good enough to get to heaven, then why did Jesus die on the cross? If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you can earn your way to heaven, then Jesus made a really stupid mistake of dying on that cross. That was a dumb thing to do. I mean, if he accepts people in... And says, you know, hey, you can come on in just by your good works. You're a good person. I'm not going to send you to hell. Well, then why on earth did he die on the cross? See? That's a bad thing. Righteousness cannot come by the law. All right? So, that is going to be the end of chapter 2 here in Galatians. Uh, we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, uh, that you did die on the cross for us and that uh, you ended the Old Testament law there of, of having to sacrifice animals and having to abide by all these rules and, and ordinances and all these different things, Lord. I, I thank you that we don't have to do those things to stay saved anymore. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help all the Christians out there to not fall for this Hebrew Roots movement, this thing of, of uh, people that oftentimes aren't even of the circumcision. They're not even Jewish people. And they're trying to draw Christians away from the simplicity that is in Christ, that is in your word and the way we're supposed to live. They're trying to draw people back and trying to get them to act like Jews and say that they're Jews. I just pray, Lord, that uh, those people out there, if they even see a hint of that, that they would just run from it, get away from it. Uh, 
just asking, Lord, that uh, everyone out there would stay focused, and, and I include myself in this, Lord. I pray that we would all stay focused on the work that you have for us, on the things that are eternal. And I just uh, pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that is it for Galatians chapter 2. Uh, we will continue on with Galatians chapter 3 next week and uh, see what transpires from that. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you to everybody who is praying for the ministry. Um, thank you to all those who donate. We just uh, really appreciate uh, the support that we get from God's people. And um, I guess that's it for this study. So thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week.